Between each line of fame and glory, oh, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Lord, we bless your holy, holy name. Welcome to our Wednesday midweek service, our winning Wednesday midweek service. Are you excited tonight? Are you excited to be here in the right place, at the right time, in the right spot, so the Lord can bless you, so he can save you, so he can keep you? I don't know about you, but Jesus is the best thing. So many things have happened down throughout the years. But there's one thing that I can count on for sure, and that is Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. The best thing. And we thank him on tonight. So grateful. I ask that you stand with me. Let us go into a moment of prayer. We welcome those that are online. We ask that you just come on in the room. The Lord is already here, and you're not too far where he can't reach you to. Just stretch your hand out. Let him know that you're a willing vessel for whatever he has for you on tonight. And he will meet you right where you are. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Kenneth Sullivan, and his wife, our first lady, Lady Roxy, we welcome you into this midweek service with us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your faithfulness towards us, for always remembering how good and how pleasant it is for us to join together in unity, for us to come in on one place, on one accord, to give you reverence, to give you thanks, to give you praise for the things you have done and the ways you have made. O oh Lord, we thank you on tonight. And we're grateful for our place and our space in you. No one like you on this earth. We can count on you. We can lean on you. We can depend on you. And you will see about us. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you. Lord, we ask that you bless our pastor as he comes before us on tonight. Strengthen him on his feet. Everything that he's prepared in private, let it be made known in public. Lord, we thank you for his wisdom and his knowledge in you. It's oftentimes we say, he's speaking directly to me, but I know he's speaking to all of you. And we thank you, Lord, for speaking in his ear, being mindful of us, knowing exactly what we need. Lord, as you continue to speak through him, Lord, and give us ears to hear what you have, us, have for us on tonight. Lord, I ask you bless those that are in this room and those that are on their way. Lord, we know that it's you that is a keeper of us. It is you that is able to take us through. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do even now. Even now, those things that are on our heart that we're worried about, those things that are concerning us. Lord, let us lay aside those things, knowing that you are in full control of everything. The things we know and the things we don't know. You're able to come in and step in and stand up for us when we can't stand up for ourselves. And Lord, we give it over to you on tonight. We praise you on tonight. We love you on tonight. We lift your name on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord. Hallelujah. How many just are still in the season of celebration? Yeah. Hallelujah. Just celebrating our Savior. Celebrating Jesus, hallelujah, amen, for the things that he has done. Glory to our King, hallelujah, glory to our King, hallelujah. Come on, lift up your heads, hold your gates, and 
be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is the king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle lift up your heads all ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors our healer comes in our king comes in our savior comes in in the name of jesus come on let's celebrate god in this place tonight hallelujah come on let heaven hear you let god hear your praise let god hear your worship come on we surrender it all to you god we surrender it all to you god have your way in this place lord hallelujah oh we thank you god we thank you glory to our king hallelujah we love you lord we praise you hallelujah anybody expecting god to do something great in this season Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Just clap your hands like this. Put your hands together as we magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh. Say he, he deserves it. He, he deserves it. That's what we're going to say. He deserves it. Hallelujah. Come on. Say, say he, he deserves it. Say he. Come on, put those hands together. Everybody say, hey. Say, he, he serves it. Say, he, he Come on, put those hands together. Oh, we bless the Lord. Glory, glory, glory to our
happy about it. I'm glad that I serve a good God that preserves me, that supplies my needs. He's a protector, a provider. Come on, y'all. Hallelujah. He deserves every bit of what I have. I'm going to give him everything that I have because I put it all in his hand.
and God is your everything. Give him one more praise in this place. God is my everything. Look at somebody and tell him he's my everything. He's my joy and sorrow. He's my hope for tomorrow. He's my will in the middle of a will. Come on, shout, he's my everything. Hallelujah. Now do me a favor for our incredible music department. I want everybody online and on the ground, give it up for them and their incredible gifts. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God for the pulling down of strongholds. How many of y'all are happy to be here on tonight? Everybody online and everybody on the ground, we are so happy to see all of our guests near and far from abroad, those who are up close here in person and streaming wherever you are. We're grateful for your presence. And to let you know it, we want to show it. So I want to ask everybody, let the church say everybody. Let me start here online first. Y'all speak to everybody you're in worship with. Tell them I'm happy to see you. I'm glad you're here. And then for everybody on the ground, I want you to greet and meet those who you're in worship with. Tell somebody I'm happy to see you. I'm glad you're here. Come on, shake a hand. Let somebody know and feel the love. My everything, my everything, my everything, my everything, he's mine, he's mine, my everything, my everything, my everything, my, 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 my. My everything, my everything, hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Savior, when the storms are raging, he's my shelter, wherever he leads me, I will follow, I love Jesus, and he loves me, come on, I love Jesus, he's my Savior, when the storms are raging, He's my shelter, wherever he leads me, I will follow. I love Jesus, he loves me. Come on, do you love the Lord on the day? I love the Lord, and I will praise his name. I love the Lord, and I will praise his name. Come on, y'all take it from there. 
Why? That's it. How good? So good. So good. So good. He has been so good. So good. So good. He has been so good to me. Come on, wave your hand if God has been good. If God has been gracious, if God has been kind, I believe we ought to come with our own praise into the house of the Lord. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'll enter his courts with praise. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, that men would magnify the Lord. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Has he redeemed you, saved you, set you free? Somebody put a praise on it right there. Make the devil real mad in the middle of the week and tell him with everything I got going on, I'm still going to give God glory. I got battles, I got tears, I got fights, I got bills, I got struggles, but I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that's within me, bless his holy name. He has done marvelous things. Somebody shout marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. He's done marvelous things. Marvelous things. I just can't tell it all. Look at somebody and tell them I can't tell it all. If I had 10,000 tongues, it still wouldn't be enough to give him glory. Amen. You don't know like I know. Y'all act like y'all came to have church on a Wednesday. What he's done for me. You don't know like I know. And I grew up in a small church, a little bitty church. And if you didn't shout, you didn't wave your hand, they say, get up from there. Get up from there. Sit down. God can't use you. Sit down. Look at somebody and tell them, get up from there. Come on, loose here, loose here. Come up off that praise. Come up off of it. Release it. Look at the dead person on your row and tell them, ain't he been good to you? What you looking like that for then? Ain't he been good to you? Why you won't clap your hands? Ain't he been good to you? Open up your mouth and give him glory. I said, give him glory. Give him glory. Give him the glory. From the rising of the sun to the setting down of the same, he's worthy to be praised. We getting ready to have a solar eclipse. Even when you don't see the sun, you still got to see the sun. And give him the glory. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody bless God one more time in this place. Oh, come on, bless him. It's an exercise. It's an exercise of faith. It's an exercise of discipline. It's an exercise of gratitude. God, thank you. Again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, can I pray for us real quick? I want to do something really quickly. Even before we go any further, I want you to touch and agree with somebody close to you. I want to pray. I want to do something in reverse. This is a day of fasting and prayer. This is a day of fasting and prayer. I think when you come to the house of worship, you should get something here you can't get nowhere else. You should experience and encounter something here you don't encounter anywhere else. God, we thank you that we made it to this place. All of the tragedies, all of the darkness, all of the heaviness, all of the burdens, all of the darts that the enemy has sent our way, we made it here. And God, we don't just speak for ourselves, we're speaking for the neighbor who we're touching and agreeing with. God, fight their battles, dry their tears, lift up their bow down head, fill their heart with encouragement, give them joy and optimism and peace. God, build them up where they've been torn down. Strengthen them where they've been weak. 
give them assurance where they've had questions and doubts. Increase their faith. Help us, Lord God, to be powerful and strong and mighty in your word, in our faith. God, your word said that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by your spirit, save the Lord. So God, give us a greater portion of your spirit in this hour. Give us a greater anointing. Empower us, infuse us, fill us to overflowing. God, help us to be the light in this dark world. Now, God, we ask that you would touch the minds and the hearts of those we're in worship with. Even those online right now, somebody's infirmed in their sick bed. They're dealing with sickness. They're dealing with disease. Touch them right where they are, Lord. We ask that you would raise them up from their bed of affliction. And even for this test, give them a testimony. They may not see themselves victorious, may not see themselves coming out on the other side. God, but give them faith to see themselves through. God, we thank you for the power and the strength that we have in numbers. We know we're not alone. We know we're not by ourselves. We thank you for our brothers and sisters whose shoulder we're holding, whose hand we're holding, who we're standing next with. God, we've made it to this place of safety. Let what we experience and enjoy here carry back home. Let your spirit permeate our lives, our living spaces, our cars, our mode of transportation. God, let your spirit be with us. Let the aura of our own spirit be that of your spirit. And God, we thank you in advance for the power you have just released, you have just given, for the faith you've just increased, even now in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. That thing you've been wrestling with is already done. That prayer you've been waiting for God to answer, he's already sent a word to it. The door you've been knocking on is already open. Shout, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. It's already done. Oh, it's already done. Oh, I hear it in the spirit realm. It's already, it's already done. He's turning it around. He's turning it around. He's turning it around. He's turning it around. He's turning it. He's turning it. He's turning it, yeah. I got to let it go. Look at somebody and tell him he's already turned it. He's already turned it. Oh, God. I want you to give your neighbor a prophetic word. It's your turn and it's your time. It's your turn and it's your time. I know you can't tell it right now. I know, I know it don't look like it, but look at somebody and tell them, it's your turn. I want to give you a word. 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 I came in here today and the wind hit me. Richard, it hit me. Snowing and raining. I said, doggone it, it's supposed to be spring. But it don't feel like it. It don't look like it. But don't deceive yourself. You in the right season. Woo! Oh God. Somebody shout, I'm in the right season. It might be windy right now. It might be cold right now. But it's my turn. And it's my time. Somebody put a praise on it right there. Look at your neighbor. I want you to rub their arm real good and tell them you in the right season. You in your winning season. You in your winning season. Don't let the devil deceive you just because it's a little wind. Whew. 
my God from on high. Y'all going to push me. I feel another thing. I'm trying to hold it. I'm trying to hold it. I'm trying to hold it. Listen. I got to give this to you really quickly. The Bible says I've been in the book of 2 Kings. My Bible study has been in 2 Kings. And the prophet spoke to a servant that was standing at the gate when Assyrians had surrounded Israel and they had been starved. It was a siege on the city and there were four lepers who got up from where they were and they went and found uh, some of the uh, food and some of the resources that the Syrians had left and God gave a word to somebody who was standing there that by this time tomorrow this thing will have broken God will have shifted it your whole situation is going to look different God sent the word before it happened and there was one man there who didn't believe what he said and he didn't get to see it he heard it but because he didn't see it because God wants you to see it before you see it for we walk by faith and not by God said that I'm going to turn some stuff around in your life. I'm working on some stuff behind the scenes. I need you to see it before you see it. I need you to shout about it. I need you to say it because you're getting ready to seize it. Somebody shout up in this place. Joshua, this land I'm giving you, I want you to see it. I want you to say it and I want you to seize it. I believe God is getting ready to do some stuff in this season, this hour. He's going to accelerate some things because the time of Jesus' return is near. And so God is moving on some stuff faster. I told a young man in my office, I said, God is going to accelerate some things because the hour uh, is drawing closer to Christ's return. So some stuff that took some people a long time to happen in their life is not going to have to take as much time for you because God got to equip us quick with some stuff. Are y'all hearing me? He's got to do it a little bit faster. He got to do it a little bit faster. And so that leads me into this even as we get ready uh, to discuss the word of God. Here's a chance so we can all participate. Let the church say all. I love the fact that what God is doing in our church is bigger than us. And, and listen, here it is. I don't want you to miss it. We get to be a part of it. We get to be a part of it. We get to witness it. We get to, we get to sow into it. We get to work toward it. We get to serve. We get to strategize and think about how to overcome some of the humps and some of the hurdles uh, that the ministry faces. And God is collectively doing something with us. And there's a story being written. Uh, there's a story being written of what God is doing uh, with the people of God here and I'm excited about it. Listen, I'm not going to belabor the point. Here's a chance where we can all, let the church say all, let's worship God in giving. Lift up your gifts, your tithes, your offerings. I want to save some time for teaching. Uh, I'll hold y'all here all night because this, y'all know this is the day I fast and pray. And so uh, this is the day that I'm already excited. I'm already on one. Amen. Do y'all hear me on the day? I, I got to pull back a little bit uh, because I'm already feeling God moving uh, internally lift up your gifts your tithes and offerings I want to pray Heavenly Father we are grateful God we thank you that we have jobs and incomes and resources even in this hour in this moment God and we sow right now out of obedience but also out of faith we give to something greater than ourselves we thank you God that this past Sunday we saw a record number of children being taught the Word of God being taught good manners and ethics and principles most importantly who Jesus is so God, we thank you that what we give toward is bigger than ourselves. We thank you for the teachers who are teaching right now children. We thank you for our teen leaders who are teaching teens right now. We thank you for those who have yielded their gifts to leading us in worship. Even though we were tired, we were weak, they lifted up our souls and challenged us. We thank you for the lights being on that we can see in this place, even as we learn and as we worship. God, so we give to something greater than ourselves. We thank you for what you called us to do right here on 38th Street to transform and change this entire area and to reclaim territory for Jesus. God, as we give now, we actually receive our gifts and tithes and offerings, but I ask that you would sow back into the lives of your people, that this would be a prosperous people, this would be a strong people, this would be a successful people, 
this would be a fruitful people God we ask for doorkeepers we ask for individuals who are the head and not the tail above and not beneath I ask that you would raise up leaders out of this place that the people that are produced from New Direction would be tapped for jobs for roles for promotions for raises for bonuses that they don't have to go looking and searching and wondering but they would be the standout individuals that because we give to you God you're gonna open up doors for us you're gonna make ways for us you're gonna bless us that we can represent you in the earth in Jesus holy name we pray amen amen come on give God a hand clap of praise listen listen really quickly do me a favor go back with me uh, to the passage of scripture um, that we read on this past Sunday and I want us to get this again because it set the tone for our questions turn with me to the gospel of John it was beautiful how that went because the week before that we were in the gospel of John I'm excited let me give this to y'all on the front end um, I prayed and asked God today I said, Lord, um, I want to know where we're going for April. What is the series? Uh, God, I'm, I'm used to being ahead on certain things. If you just want this to be pastor's playlist and I don't know and it's a mix, then I'm cool with that. But God did exceedingly abundantly. I'm starting a brand new series this Sunday called Second Chances. Second Chances. Uh, we know God is more than a God of a second chance. He's a God of another chance. You used your second chance a long time ago. But he gave you another chance. Amen. But there are people in scripture that we see who rebounded from bad decisions and bad choices and mistakes. And I want to inspire us and I want to challenge us and look at how God used certain individuals. Moses was a murderer, yet God gave him another chance. Peter failed Jesus. He denied him, but God gave him another chance. Joshua goes to take Ai. He failed. There's sin in the camp. He goes back and he's victorious. There are several examples where we see people who fail who got back up, watch this, and I don't want you to miss this, their greatest work was done on the latter end than the former end. Because sometimes we think because we haven't accomplished something, done something in one season, that the best is not yet to come. God is saying, I'm getting ready to save my best for last in your life. I'm going to pull some stuff out of you you didn't even know was there. I'm going to use you in a different way. Elijah was a prophet and God said hold on you're not just going to be a prophet I want you to anoint the next king Jehu then I want you to anoint the next prophet Elisha your work is not done yet look at somebody and tell them God's not done with you yet I don't care how many mistakes you made how many bad choices and decisions you've done God said I'm still going to give you another chance even in advance I dare you to give God some praise for another chance God specializes in recycling things. Listen, John is where I want to turn our attention. Jesus says something here, and I'm not going to hold us long on the night. Jesus says something here, and what he says is exclusive. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. You all may be seated. And that's found certainly in the gospel of John where Jesus shares that. And from that passage of scripture, we understand he's the only way. Listen, we talked about on Sunday, and I want us to get this. I just shared this with our men. I'm excited about how God is using our men's ministry. Ladies, did y'all have a good time on the night in y'all's gathering? Oh, y'all had a good time, hey, amen. Now, now I'm going to have to challenge the brothers. Brothers, did y'all have a good time in y'all's meeting on tonight? That was a little weak, brothers. Some of the, we, got a little bro, we got some brothers missing on tonight. They, they get filled so full at 6 o'clock. I'm trying to pull all of them in here. They don't always obey like they're supposed to. So y'all getting a remnant tonight. But we talked about on Sunday, there's three major points, and I want to go over those really quickly. And I do want to pour this out on you all really quickly. The three points were Jesus is real, Jesus is relevant, Jesus is risen. Now let me lay the groundwork by giving this to you all. I am a Bible teaching, expository teaching pastor. The scripture says I would not have you to be ignorant, my brethren. Amen? I want you to have fire and understanding. Somebody say, and understanding, Sister Rita, good to see you. 
That means that I want us to know what we believe and why we believe it, right? You want to be doctrinally sound and theologically sound so that you have an understanding. The scripture says this, always and always be ready to be ready to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. What that means is to contend for the faith. We're in a day and age where we're hearing strange new doctrines, strange new ideas. You've got cults that give you a little bit of truth, but a whole lot of lies. So you hear people say, well, we believe in Jesus too. Okay, what do you believe about Jesus? Right? Because Jesus makes it absolutely clear, I am God in human flesh. He's not just the prophet, as the Muslims would say. Oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. He's, okay, no, he's not just a prophet. Then you have some who present a different version of Christ. Mormons, Jehovah Witness, a, di a different version of Christ. And what happens is, I need y'all to hear this. The scripture says in the last days, imposters will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. And I don't want you to be deceived and carried about by every wind of doctrine so that you understand the truth and you know the truth. You know what they do at the U.S. Mint is that they train the individuals who work there in noticing the realness of a particular dollar bill so that when they get a counterfeit, they can immediately spot the counterfeit. Watch this. They don't train them in the counterfeit dollar. They train them in the real thing so that when they see something counterfeit, they recognize that ain't real. My job as your pastor is to train you in the real thing so that even when you hear something that sounds good, you're like, hold on, that, don't, that ain't the real thing. This is the real thing. So the first point was Jesus is real. He's real. Somebody say real. He's not only real, meaning that he's real in the sense of the difference he makes in all of our lives, and all of us could testify of that. He is real. He is living. He is alive. He is real. And so there's a few questions that were posed, and I, and I, and I want to do our Bible study this way because if you've got questions, um, we've got an opportunity for you to be able to ask those questions. Here's a couple of questions that came out of our Bible study. And number one, uh, someone asked this question, how do I share how Christ is real and relevant to people who seem to be doing well in life without a relationship with God? Sometimes we think Christianity is for the down and out, right? We talk about the church ought to be open to the sinner, to the drug dealer, to the prostitute. We should, and we should seek to make people feel welcome so they can get the truth in them. But the gospel is not just for the down and out. It's also for the up and in. In fact, the Bible says, I want you to get this, that it is harder for a rich man to enter into heaven than it is for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle. What that means is some people's riches and their lifestyle has blinded them and it is really a curse to them. Because they're comfortable in the condition that they're in. The Bible says, woe unto those who are in ease in Zion. The word's job is not only to comfort the afflicted. People are crying to comfort them, encourage them. But it's also designed to afflict those who are in comfort. Did you catch what I said? So don't allow yourself to be deceived in thinking people don't need Jesus because they're driving a Benz. Because they're living in a certain zip code. Can I tell y'all one thing that our pantry exposed to me was the need that is out there. Whew, thank you, Holy Spirit. Because people can look like they're doing well when they're really struggling. We don't have hoopties in line. We got Benzes, Escalades. Y'all ain't talking about me. Coming to get food. Can I go here? If I had time, I would build this case. Because y'all know, people have a good way of putting on a good facade. We just even talked about when you witness and share your faith and you share the truth with people. You just do your job and sow the seed because you don't know how it's taking root or taking shape in somebody's life. I used to witness to people and it seemed like it didn't move them. They weren't bothered. 
but I know that the word still works and the potency of the word and the spirit will bother people even when they're not in your presence. There's people based upon your witness who is still wrestling with some of what you shared because once you know the truth, you can't unlearn the truth. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. And our job to that point is to share with people our faith, to share with them that Jesus is real, and we're not always assigned to see the results. We're just called to do the deeds. Did you hear what I said, Sister Clara? There's going to be people in heaven based upon what you did, and you will never meet them. There will be your good works that meet you in heaven and you didn't even know how directly you impacted somebody. God just said, do it, be faithful in it, show up and serve, show up and serve. Make sure that you speak when I tell you to speak, witness to who I tell you to witness to, pray for who I tell you to pray for, be kind to who I tell you to be kind to, be generous to who I tell you to be generous to. You may not ever even meet them or know their name, but when Jesus returned, he said, I'm going to ask some questions when I was hungry did you feed me when I was thirsty did you give me drink if you did it to the least of these you did it unto me so just do what God called you to do just do what you called to do can I tell you as a pastor our broadcast goes all over the world there's thousands possibly millions of people hearing the word of God through this place I'll never meet them but I'll reap the benefits of it who God I feel like having church now because some of the blessings God has for you, you're not going to get on this side. Some of the blessings God has for you, you're going to get in heaven. The old saints used to say, I'm sending up my timber. What does that mean? They said, I got a home over there and I'm sending up building material here from based upon what I'm doing so that when it meets me in heaven, I won't be in a shack or a shanty. I got a mansion over there. Somebody in here ought to holler back at me. Look at somebody and tell them, send up your timber. That's why we work. That's why we serve. That's why we witness. That's why we preach. Because God says, I don't just want you to look at this life, but the life to come. So to answer that question, to answer the question is this. Here's at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what you have materially. Where will you spend eternity? What will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? I don't care about what you have outwardly. You are a soul. Your car won't go to heaven. Your house won't go to heaven. Your check and pay stub won't go to heaven. Your income, your degree, your hair, your nails, your lashes. Y'all ain't hollering back at me on today. I love y'all. I ain't knocking it. Y'all look good, boo. You look good in it, boo. Wear them lashes. You wear them. I just want you to know. It's all going to stay here. Do you hear me on today? It's going to stay here. So here's the second question. I want y'all to get this. Um, I love this because answering these questions helps to solidify our faith. Here's number two. It says, I've been through a lot of serious things over the years. God brought me from a mighty long way. But are there ever times when I should not share my testimony with others? Especially those not in church, could it ever be a problem to be too real? I like that. Let me say this about witnessing. Um, I sought, when I accepted Christ into my life, um, you know, I had all this stuff I had done and all this crazy stuff, and, and I didn't want my witness just to be all of the stuff I did. That's why I enrolled in Bible college. I wanted Bible knowledge. I wanted to be able to witness and I didn't just want to, you know, because you heard people back in the day, they would have people come in and share their testimony, and, and they did all this stuff, and sometimes you wondered, was it real? <laughs> y'all know what I'm saying? Because y'all know some people testified, and some people test a lie, right? And so I didn't want my testimony just to be, God delivered me from this, he did all of that. It took me a long time to start t sharing my testimony, because I wanted people... As Paul said, their faith to rest in Christ and his word. But I understood that in order for people, when God does such a work in your life, he can change you so much so you don't look like what you used to and people will have no idea. 
they'll make assumptions that you didn't do certain things, wasn't involved in certain stuff, and God didn't deliver you. You understand what I'm saying? And so some people need that hope because if you got a drowning man who's struggling to come out of what he's in, he needs somebody who can give him hope to say, I've been there too. Hold on, let me throw you this life raft. We can help pull you out of here, right? The Bible says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So you may not know hermeneutics, homiletics, you may not know Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew in the Old Testament. You may not know all of these different doctrinal themes and big words and terms, uh, theological. You may not know that. You may be like that blind man who Jesus healed, who they questioned, and he said, I don't know all, uh, all that stuff y'all asking me. All I know is I was blind and he opened my eyes. So share your testimony, but the question is, is there such thing as too much? Let me say this. This is very important. Somebody say wisdom. Yeah. Certain things are for you to take to the grave. Don't y'all act like y'all got some stuff y'all ain't taken to the grave. Amen. Some, everybody don't need to hear everything. Saved or unsaved. Some people can't handle. And let me say this. When you witness, be general. Be specific when you need to be. But not everything needs to be shared with everybody. I want you to get this. If it doesn't help them get closer to God, leave those details out. If it challenges them, if they're dealing with something very specifically and you have to get graphic with it to help paint the picture for them and it will help them identify that you've been in that place and you've been delivered, then share that with them. But there are certain things you don't need to share with everybody because not everybody's at the same spiritual level or mature enough to handle some of what you share with them. And some people can't quite handle some of the stuff God delivered you from because it will throw them off in terms of their viewing God and viewing you. Are y'all, is that making sense to me? Let me give this to y'all while the Holy Spirit is pushing me. As a church, we also have to understand, and this is a pivot just a little bit. We got to understand that everybody's at a different spiritual level. That's why you got to stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Help people who lagging behind, a brother and sister, you, they, you see they hitting and missing church. They're not here. They're not in the word. Challenge them. Exhort them. But God says, I want you to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. I want you to focus on becoming the best version of yourself. And when you become the best version of yourself, people will be drawn to the success that you have in your life and the doors that are opening, how prayers are being answered and ways are being made. Am I talking to anybody up in here? So even as you testify and even as you share about what God has done in your life, share what Jesus has done, but you need some wisdom. Everything is not meant to be shared with everybody. If it's not going to edify them or help draw them to Christ, there are certain things to leave out. But certainly make sure you share your testimony. There is a such thing as sharing too much. And this is where, let me throw this out there. This is where the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom and the Holy Spirit tells us when to be quiet. If you got the Holy Spirit, there's a meter that goes off and tells you stop. Yeah, lift up your hand, you know what I'm talking about. Look, can I give y'all this? This for real, for real. This for real. Because um, even as you start growing and you get certain relationships, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again because I want y'all to get this and I want to keep you from hurting yourself. Don't mistake moments of intimacy for loyalty. What do you mean by that? You get to feeling real good with this person and then you tell yourself, I think I can trust them with this. Mm -mm, no, you can't. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? How many of us have made mistakes by sharing the wrong things with the wrong people we got too comfortable with only to regret it later on? And you can't take it back. 
So I want to tell you, be wise even in your relationships and what you share. Jesus shared with the disciples certain things in stages and phases. Ooh, thank you, Holy Ghost. There were only three disciples who got to see the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. There were certain ones that didn't get to see everything. Judas don't need to be here right now. He served a purpose, but he ain't in on this one. Are y'all talking talk back to me on the day? Can, I'm on, y'all going to make me flow because I want to give y'all this. It's wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Don't. This don't have nothing to do with that. It's good meat. It's good meat. You know, people, there was a season. You don't hear it no more. I'm cutting them off. I'm cutting people off. Let me give you another word. Don't cut them off. Categorize them. You just got them in the wrong category. No, everybody has their place. You thought they were a confidant. They were just a business associate. You thought they were a friend. No, it was an acquaintance. Are y'all catching this on today? What happens is we miscategorize people and we hurt ourselves by putting expectations on them that you weren't supposed to put on them. Why ain't you giving me back what I'm giving you? Because they're not capable of it. They're not the person God wanted you to get that from. And the sooner you'll understand that, you'll let some stuff and people go. Look at somebody tell them that's for free. That's for free. Look at all the freebies y'all get on a Wednesday night. Y'all getting all kind of free. You get... All right. Number three, here's another question. I know that Jesus' death was necessary to atone for our sins. Heavy atone. But what exactly does the resurrection signify in the process of salvation? The resurrection, let me, let me give you these stages. Here's some theological terms. Um, we get saved. You may want to write these down or catch it later on. We get saved. That's salvation. That's salvation. Then there's the work of sanctification. Sanctification is God changing us, helping shape us, mold us, giving us new behavior patterns, habits, thoughts, ideas, how we're supposed to live. The word is sanctifying us. It's, he's setting us apart. He's purifying us, getting stuff off us. Last word. Then there's glorification. Glorification is when we die and we have glorified bodies, right? Your body right now is susceptible to sin and it is not capable of handling heaven. Have you ever seen when astronauts go into outer space, you got to have a certain suit, you have a certain helmet because you can't handle the pressure at those levels? It's the same thing as individuals we can't handle heaven in the presence of God. Our bodies have to be glorified. They have to be transformed. Y'all going to make me dig in my bag on tonight. That's why when I was in school, there were people who talked about the cessation of the gifts. C-E-S-S-A-T-I-O-N, the cessation. They would tell you that the gifts have ceased. The gifts are no longer applicable, Sister Linda, that you don't need the spiritual gifts. Where the Bible doesn't say that. It says, earnestly desire all of the gifts. The gifts are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4. The gifts, earnestly desire the gifts. The gifts of prophecy are still available. The gifts of uh, speaking in tongues is available. The gifts of a word of knowledge, right? The gift, go after the gifts. You will no longer need the gifts once we're glorified and over in heaven because the body of Christ has been raptured out of the world. Is this making sense to y'all? The gifts are used to minister to the body of Christ. So we use our gifts while we're here. And they would take that verse that says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we know in part, we prophesy in part, when that which is perfect has come, that which is imperfect will be done away with. And they would take that and say, that's the cessation of the gifts. No, what he's saying is we look in a mirror dimly. We only know so much about God right now on this side, on earth, we're scratching the surface. But when we're glorified, we will be able to see him as he is, and we will be able to handle his glory. Are y'all hearing me on today? Is this making sense? See, you can't handle the unsheathed glory of God. 
That's why when Moses said, show me your glory, God said, I can't show you that. I'm too hot to handle, too cold to hold, too much to touch. What I'll do is I'll put you in the cleft and I'll pass by and you'll catch the backside of me. Woo, God. God, show me your glory. And just by him seeing the backside of God, Moses came down from that mountain and the people couldn't look at him because the glory... God is just that powerful. He's broken himself down in bite-sized pieces so we can handle it at our level. Because you ain't ready yet. It's too much. Y'all gonna make me dig. (laughs) Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says he was no more. I want to walk so close with God that he says, come on, let me take you on up to glory. Elijah didn't die a natural death. God sent chariots of fire to come scoop him up. I want to live at a level where I see some stuff I has not seen. I hear some stuff. Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man. But the Lord has revealed it to me. I want to walk so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anyhow. I want to talk so God can use me. Is this making sense to you? Our goal, I got two more questions. I want to wrap it up, but I really want you to catch this. Our goal as Christians and believers who are sanctified, watch this, set your affections on things above, not things below. God is calling you up. The world is calling you down. It's trying to pull you down so that you're focused on carnal things, carnal, carnivorous, flesh-eating creatures, carnivores, You focus on carnal things rather than spiritual things. But once you start getting a taste of spiritual things and the presence of God and the glory of God, you'll stop desiring some of the stuff you used to desire. Is there anybody here who's grown and your appetite has changed? That you've grown and you're like, how did I used to like that? How did I used to want to go over there? I can't believe I wanted to enjoy that. How did I not have it in me to cut that loose? Because your appetite has changed. If any man or woman be in Christ, there are new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Somebody shout new. I want new conversations. I want new friends. I got new aspirations. I got new levels I'm trying to go through. I'm trying to get through new doors. I'm trying to have new experiences. Experiences. I'm trying to see new things. I'm trying to have God do some new stuff. And you stuck on that old stuff. I'm trying to upgrade and get something new. That's why the devil wants to keep you stuck on the old. So we come in here and there's a tug of war. We're trying to pull you out of the old into the new. Who? We're trying to pull you off of carnal into that which is spiritual. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because I believe when you really show enough, get a taste. You will see he's sweeter than a honey in a honeycomb. I want to know, is there anybody in here who can say, I tried it for myself. I found out he's sweeter than the, oh, he's sweet, I know. He's sweet, I know. Dark clouds may rise, torment, wind may blow, but I'll tell the world wherever I go. He's sweet. And so when we talk about this, i got to give you this other question. Pastor, you quoted Karl Marx as saying that religion is the opium for the masses. What does that even mean? Marx, Karl Marx, Marxist beliefs, Marxism, some of you all may be familiar with it. It has had a very profound impact on societies and cultures. Some would say even more than average Karl Marx gives that quote, religion is the opium to the masses. Opium was the drug they would use or drug of choice during that time. And so he said that people would use religion to deaden people's senses so that they would not be able to experience or live in the reality that was around them. So his suggestion was religion was just used to deaden people's senses. It is designed for people to escape what they're in. That is really nothing to it. It is the opium for the masses. I'm above that. That's what Marx was saying. But it's not the opium to the masses. It is the bomb in Gilead. 
It is not something that we use to escape. It's something that we found heals that is real that makes a difference in our lives. So that's what Marx meant by that, but, but not just religion, a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. I got one more question and I'll get out of here. The message talked about how Jesus can relate to us as an ethnic minority living under oppression. What did Jesus do as a minority who was constantly harassed and eventually falsely accused of a crime that we can learn from today? What we can learn from Hebrews chapter 4, and I want you to, to, to write that down and read Hebrews in your private time. The book of Hebrews is written back to a Jewish audience that is written to Jewish believers who are dealing with hardships in their faith. They're dealing with hardships, and so the whole book of Hebrews, if you read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, he starts by laying the groundwork to show the Hebrew people who were in Judaism before they came to Christ that Christ is superior to the sacrificial system of Moses, that he is superior to the angels, he is superior to everything that they have formerly known, and that they need to keep moving forward in Christ. So then in chapter 4 of Hebrews, watch what he says. He says, we do not have a high priest. Remember, they were in Judaism. They were familiar with a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. What is he saying? He's saying that Jesus, 100% God, as God, he is able to redeem us. As man, he's able to relate to us. Because when he became a man, he was born to a poor, impoverished family that was a minority under Roman occupation. So he saw at an early age, as his family had to flee as refugees down to Egypt, that there was the oppressed and there were those who were oppressors. So Jesus can relate to wherever you are on the spectrum of life, whether you're single, whether you've been shut out, whether you've been overlooked, whether you have been prejudged, whether you have been in poverty, whether you've been looked at a certain way. Jesus knows what it feels like. That's why you can come to him in prayer and be real with him and say, I got these feelings with this stuff that I'm dealing with this pressure with the challenges of life and the Bible says he's able to comfort you he's able to encourage you in that moment that's why the devil don't want you to pray because when you pray that's when God begins to strengthen you when you pray that's when God begins to comfort you when you pray that's when God gives you assurance when you pray that's when he gives you power when you pray that's when he lifts you up I must tell Jesus all of my struggles I cannot carry these burdens alone in my distressing he kindly will hear me he loves and cares for his own have a little talk with Jesus tell him all about your trouble he'll hear your faintest cry anybody know he'll answer I dare you to open up your mouth and say I love the Lord he heard my cry and pitied every one of my throne as long as I live and trouble rise I'll hasten to his have I got witnesses up in this place that no prayer still works praise still works the word still works and what you have is real is relevant because he's risen lift up your voice and give God glory he lives he lives my savior lives today good God almighty he walks with me and talks with me a long life, narrow way. Stand on your feet. I'm going to let you go. I want you to get it in you that you're excited. Have you ever seen a play with those toys in the pool that no matter how you try to push them down, they keep coming back up? Why? Because they got something in them. That's something inside of them, no matter what happens around them, it keeps pushing them back up. I want you to have a faith that is so powerful, confident in the God that you serve, hope in the eternal that you hope to see, 
that no matter what happens in this life, you just keep on coming back up. Bills try to push you down. Hardships try to push you down. Trouble try to push you down. The devil try to hold you down. But I keep getting back up again. I got the clothes, but I got one more for you. Now, now I'm telling my age. We used to have toys when I was a kid. Those little eggs. Weeble wobbles. I remember y'all remember those. They had a phrase from they said, Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Who glory. I need somebody to know sometime the wind may blow. The struggle and pressure might be strong. It tempts to knock me down, but I keep getting back up, lifting up my hands. One more time, if you're not too mean, give God some glory. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Listen, listen. I'm excited about what God is doing in the earth. I want you all to have the faith. Sister Shawana, good to see you. I want you all to have the faith. Here's the word, fortitude. Somebody say fortitude. I, y'all, I don't want us to be break down easy believers. Easily offended. Easily cry. Easily drop out. Easily back up on God. No, keep going. The race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong but to the one who endures until the end. But listen, you all have heard excitement and joy over Jesus. And I love the song by Kirk Franklin. He said, some might ask the question, why do we sing? When we lift our hands to Jesus, what do we really mean? He said, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. I know he watches over me. Listen, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're online right now. I see you. You're on the ground. It may be somebody here today. You're in the building, but you're not in the body. You're here, but you haven't yet crossed over to give your life fully to Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus loves you in spite of all he knows about you. Jesus loves you in spite of your past. In fact, he's more concerned about your future than he is your past. And if you would come to Jesus, he will rewrite your story. He's a God who specializes in changing stories and plot twists. He is the author and finisher of our faith. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you like to give your heart to him, your life to him, you want to be born again. Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. If that's you and you would like to give your heart to Jesus, lift up your hand right where you are. Lift it up. Lift it up. We'll see it. We'll make sure that you get the right support and you get plugged in. If you're online, that extends to you as well. We're excited for you and your decision. Amen. Amen. All is well in the house of the Lord. Give God some praise. Let me say this really quickly while Deacon Harris is here. Uh, our, our mayor is going to be with us this Sunday at both of our services uh, for his summer jobs program. If you have any teens, amen, you got any teens, sign them up for a job. Mayor Hogg said is committed to these programs. And so if you've got teenagers, bring them out. We're going to have tables ready for them to be able to sign up and get a job. Um, I'm excited about that, especially as we get ready to go into spring and summer. We know that idle time and idle minds are the devil's workshop, as they say. So we want to make sure young people get plugged in. Also, I'm excited for those who are at the North Campus. We finally today got approved on all of our permits. And, and, and it, it, it helps having friends in powerful places too sometimes, amen. You put a little fire behind folk, amen. But I'm excited about that and we look to hopefully start um, with our structural uh, work and our drainage work over there. I know it's been a long time and so I want us as a church to just be in prayer about how God moves us because I really believe this and I'm going to let y'all go. I ran over by seven minutes. I, I, I really believe this y'all with every fiber in my being. I, I believe this. I believe this. I believe that God is using us to gather in a harvest in these hours that we're in. I believe God wants to use you and he's using me to do that and this, somebody say this church belongs to God. It don't belong to Pastor Sullivan. It don't belong to Dr. Sullivan. It belongs to God, right? Upon, my, upon this rock, I built my church. Amen. I am an under-shepherd. This is God's church. Amen. That's why I don't stress over where we're going to go and what we're going to do. It's God. It was his first. Amen. So we trust him for that. Amen. Listen, touch and agree with somebody close to you. I want to pray with and for you right where you are. And I want us 
to leave out of here on a high note. God, even now, we ask, God, that as we get ready to leave this place and never your presence, God, that you would bless the rest of our week. Bless us even as we've gone into a new month. Go ahead of us. God, we ask that you would cover our homes, cover our property, cover our valuables, cover our loved ones, cover us as we sleep at night, cover us as we travel to and fro from work and back. God, cover us even while we sleep, our thoughts. We ask that the enemy would not be able to get in our dreams. We ask that we would have sweet dreams and not nightmares. We ask, Lord God, that you would fill our hearts with joy. Let it be in our homes. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, Lord, we ask you would lift up a standard against him. Bless your people even now as we get ready to leave this place, but never your presence. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Go forth and be blessed in Jesus' name. God bless you.